have received a lot of questions from prospective missionaries, none of which have been previously viewed by Elder and Sister Sigehema, so they're going into this blind. Um, Elder and Sister Sigehema, many students have asked about effectively preparing for a mission. Calum Howell from a BYU mission prep class asked, what should I be praying for in preparation for my mission? And a UVU student asked, how can I best prepare myself to leave on my mission? What can I do to make sure I'm ready? Elder Sikihema, what are your thoughts? The best thing that you can do, the, the best thing that you can do to prepare for a mission is read the Book of Mormon. Read the Book of Mormon and, and understand why the Book of Mormon is written and for whom. The Book of Mormon was written for our day. It was not written for the Nephites or the Lamanites. They didn't even have it. They didn't, it wasn't published for them. It was intended for our specific day. And as you read the Book of Mormon, you'll begin to understand your role in what President Nelson calls the gathering of Israel. The gathering of Israel on both sides of the veil. There'll come a time when you'll help gather Israel on the other side of the veil, and you, some of you may already be doing that uh, by going to the temple and doing baptisms for the dead. But you young men, you have a specific priesthood duty and responsibility to be missionaries and help gather Israel. And it may not necessarily, by the way, be proselyting. Um, the Lord... The Lord appreciates and he loves and he honors those who serve service missions um, every bit as much. Um, so consider that. So read the Book of Mormon. Now, of course, there's lots of other things that you've got to do. You've got to, you know, try to raise as much money as you can, save as much money as you can. Your family, you know, ought to be able to help you uh, if they're in a position to. But do everything that you can and prepare yourself spiritually to serve a mission. Okay, here's another question. What advice would you give for those who are unable to serve their mission or returned early due to the COVID pandemic and now may be a little older in their 20s? Your circumstances are your circumstances. Um, we want every able young man and young women who wish to go to be able to serve. And if your circumstances are such that... Um, and some of you probably have siblings who went out during COVID and had to come back early. And they were given, uh, because of the unique circumstances, um, you know, they were, I think they were given a choice whether to stay for a while, go to school, or go back, um, or go back later. They had, they had other options. That's no longer the case, right? We don't, we're not dealing with a pandemic anymore, at least for now. If another one hits us, we'll know how to, how to work through it much better, although we were really pretty good. The church did a really phenomenal job in handling that. That said, whatever your circumstances are, um, we want you to be healthy, to be strong, to be prepared in every way possible to go and serve a mission because it's rigorous. It's hard. It's tough. Um, you know, we're not going to sugarcoat that. It's tough to go on a mission and to be a, a, a good missionary. Um, so we want you to do everything you can to be ready to go. And if circumstances are such that some had to come home early. Uh, I've heard Elder Holland say this, that if your mission turned out to be three months or six months, if you serve a service mission, which may be six months, a year, a year and a half, wh however long your mission is, is how long it is. And the Lord will accept your offering whatever it is. Do we want you to serve 18 months for young women and two years for young men? Of course we do. We want you to serve the full term. But your circumstances being what they are, if you're sick, all kinds of things happen. You may have to come home early. You come home early. Um, but we want you to have that experience. I'm just telling you, young men, you do not want to miss out on something so remarkably and so fundamentally foundational in your life. I... I heard um, President Ballard say this, and I, I, I think you have too. And it really, it, it took me back a little bit when I heard him say it. He said that his mission 
was the greatest training he's ever received in the church. President Ballard, what's, how old is he now? 94? 93. 93 or 94? He's been, he's the acting quorum president in the 12, been an apostle for, what, almost 50 years, 40 years. He says that the greatest training he's ever received in the church was his mission. That to me was, whoa, that is amazing that his two years on a mission in London was the greatest training he's ever received, and he is the president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. This next question is about the difficulty of leaving on a mission. Tyler Giles, a student at BYU, asked, how do I not worry about leaving everything behind? I think you'll worry, but you, you, you just go. You got to go anyway, right? If you're going to go, go. Mm -hmm. um, Elder Sikahema can probably add what he knew he was leaving behind um, to go. He had started his football career, and, and it was promising. Things were looking good for him. And at the time that he decided to go, his father was not active in the church. And not only did he not encourage him to go, he discouraged him from going and he th he thought it was kind of a waste of time and you know concentrate stay home and concentrate on your football career my dad wanted me to get to the NFL uh, more than I did <laughs> he really wanted that experience and the new house that came along with it probably you know <laughs> um, so I whatever whatever that is whatever it is that you're leaving just just leave uh, and go uh, let me just add to that. Thank you, honey. That was, that was beautiful. I would say this. Whatever you think you're going to leave, all right, whatever you think you're going to leave, a scholarship, girlfriend, boyfriend, car, I, you, you can name whatever it is that you think you're going to leave behind and sacrifice. Here's what's going to happen. And you have already had this experience because you, you already know it, but you don't really realize it. You have already in your life, in your young lives, as 17, 18, 19-year-old young people, you have given stuff up for the Lord yeah. in your lives. And you may not even fully appreciate it, but you have already given stuff up for the Lord. And then think in your mind about what those things are that you've given up and how the Lord has already blessed you for giving up what you've given up. Coffee, tea, right alcohol tobacco you've given things up and it has blessed you tenfold and so if you just think about the things that you stand to lose you never lose in the lord's economy you never ever lose you always win thank you we have time for about two more questions so i'll ask one and then luke will ask our final question um We've received, a, we've received a lot of questions from young women asking whether or not um, they should serve a mission. One UVU mission prep student asked, as a woman, what is the best thing for me to do in regards to a mission if I don't feel I've received a yes or no from God about going? Do you have thoughts, Sister Sikahema? I, I just feel like if, if that's an elder speaking, then that's, it's a whole different answer, right? Yes. Um, if a sister is, is praying to know, I, I just think that that's where you're going to get your answer. I didn't serve a mission. Um, I got here to BYU. We met. And I knew we were supposed to get married when we did. I've been her mission. And 38-year um, mission. I'm sorry, honey. <laughs> um, but as I said, you know, we... Missionary work looks differently, I think, you know. Yeah. Um, we do missionary work every day. But I, I just, in answer to your question, I just feel like for sisters, just go by the Spirit and know. Uh, you know, you, you should be able to, to know for yourself if, if, it's, if it's right. Thank you. Good question. All right. By the way, for you elders... I would say this, if I just may add. Because um, I get this question all the time 
from athletes who ask me, hey, or, or, or they tell me usually, um, I'm praying to know that whether I should go because of my football career in college. And my answer is always the same. It's always this. The Lord has already spoken on it. So um, through his prophets, he has already spoken on whether you should go on a mission or not. And the answer is unequivocally, yes, you have a duty to go and serve a mission if you're a young man. The question you should ask isn't whether you should go, it's please give me the courage to go. Because that's the question to, that's, that's how you should phrase and frame a question if you're a young man. Um, give me the courage to go serve a mission. Because the Lord has already spoken on it. And, you know, he's spoken on tithing. He's spoken on the word of wisdom. There's, there are, you know, law of chastity. The Lord, there's no reason to, you know, Ask the Lord whether living the, you should live the law of chastity. No, he's, he's spoken on that. You need to pray and ask for the courage to live the law of chastity or live the word of wisdom, whatever it is. Same way for missions. All right. All right. Thanks, Thank guys. Thank you so much. I know Courtney said this was going to be the last question, but I want to add another one just because I think it's an important issue. Okay. So mental health is a big concern for many prospective missionaries. And Liv, a student from UVU, asked, as someone who struggles with mental health, what advice do you have regarding preparation for a full-time mission? If you're, you and your bishop and your stake president determine that a service missionary, a service mission is what you should serve, just know this, that the Lord accepts your offering. He accepts your offering, whether it's, again, three months, six months, a year, a year and a half, whatever, two years, whatever it is. A service mission is a phenomenal thing to do if you suffer from from mental illness or have some, some kind of physical ailment or th something that would keep you from serving a proselyting mission. So, so do that. Our final question is about making your mission a foundation for the rest of your life. Tony Boxer from BYU Mission Prep asks, how can I use these years to better prepare myself for lifelong service? As I was talking about the things that um, they were skills, they, they were life skills, they were um, just all the things that he, that Elder Sikahema learned from his mission president and, and his wife, President Sister Greenwood. The reason I'm so indebted to them is because he has made those things a foundation for the rest of his life. And it changed his life. Really, it changed. They, they taught him things, and not just spiritual things, but there were temporal things that he wouldn't otherwise have learned. Um, it, it's, it's so valuable. Uh, so just, you know, internalize them, learn them, and just keep them there. Develop good habits so that when you get home, it just continues. I, I learned the doctrine of Christ mm -hmm. on my mission. And I understood it. Um, that having faith and, and repenting and baptism and receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost and enduring to the end was, is the foundation of my life. And I learned that on my mission. Now, could I have learned it not going on a mission? Of course. Because a mission is, is not a ordinance for salvation or exaltation. Lots of people will be in the celestial kingdom who have not served missions, right? Including, I believe, the entire first presidency. Their circumstances were different. So, they, they weren't able to go or they didn't go. Yours, it's a different time and your, the mandate for you from a prophet of God is to go be missionaries. And I'm speaking to you young men. You young women, you, you all know this. You have the option. But I also learned other things. There were other things that I learned on my mission about church government, about other doctrine that I didn't know about. There were, um, and then just some simple things that I didn't know growing up in the home that I grew up in. I'm Tongan. And I didn't know 
duh. I didn't know growing up in my home, this is just a cultural thing, but I didn't know to stand up when a woman walks into a room. I didn't know that. Some, something simple my mission president taught me. And you know what? The very first time I met Sister Sikahema, I stood and reached out my hand and shook her hand and, and met her. And just the fact that I stood, was imp- I think it impressed her. <laughs> I wouldn't have done that if I hadn't gone on a mission. I learned that by being a missionary. Just so simple, right? There are other things. I became a broadcaster later in my life and my career. And I did it without a degree from BYU. <laughs> learned it on my own. Not on my own. I learned it on my mission. I learned how to speak by being a missionary. I get the degree later. Um, but I, I owe my broadcasting career to being a missionary, to serving a mission, learning how to talk to people and, and get, learning how to just, you know, be natural, try to be natural. Uh, so there were other things that I learned as a missionary. All right, I've talked way too much. <laughs> as our time comes to a close, we would like to thank Elder and Sister Sikahema for answering our questions about missionary service this evening. We're so grateful for your insights. We would also like to thank everyone who submitted questions, and we want to especially thank BYU Religious Education and Utah Valley Institute of Religion for hosting this prospective missionary devotional. Elder and Sister Sikahema, we would love to invite you to share any closing remarks. I will share a very simple testimony um, that I love my Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm thankful for his atoning sacrifice for me, for all of us. I'm grateful for our prophet, and I know he is our prophet today, President Russell M. Nelson. I'm thankful for missionary work. For the work, and by that I mean the work that is done by missionaries. And we're all missionaries, but I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for the challenge that we've all been given to help in this great gathering of Israel. And I pray that we will all do that in our own way. We love you. We're so grateful to be here with all of you. Um, And I know that all that has been talked about tonight is is true. And um, know that we love you, and more importantly, that the Lord loves you. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you, sweetheart. I'll just stand to do this. Uh, Exactly a week ago, my wife and I were back east on assignment, and we were in the Sacred Grove. Uh, Raise your hand if you've been in the Sacred Grove. Wow, so many of you. Good for you. So you'll appreciate this. We went and took a seat on a bench, and there weren't a lot of people there. There's not a lot of traffic there uh, in in the fall. My wife and I went and sat on a bench and just quietly listened to the birds hum and sing. I only broke the silence by reciting something that I memorized since I was just about your age. When the light rested upon me, I saw two personages whose brightness and glory defy all description standing above me in the air. One of them spake unto me, calling me by name, and said, pointing to the other, this is my beloved son, hear him. I bear witness to you with all the power that I can muster that that event took place in upstate New York in the spring of 1820. Less than a dozen years later, and the prophet Joseph was just, I believe he had just turned 26, wrote these words. And now, after the many testimonies which have been given of him, this is the testimony, last of all, which we give of him, that he lives. For we saw him even on the right hand of God, 
and we heard the voice bear record that he is the only begotten of the Father, that by him, through him, and of him the worlds are and were created, and the inhabitants thereof are begotten sons and daughters unto God. Brothers and sisters, do not miss your opportunity to go proclaim, proclaim to the world as Courtney is about to do in Jacksonville, Florida, and Luke will uh, receive a call at some point uh, later uh, this fall or in the winter. Don't cheat yourself of the opportunity to go proclaim the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. It was for that very reason and others that you were saved to come at this specific time in the world's history. I bear witness of these truths that God lives, he loves us, we are his children. His mouthpiece on the earth today is Russell Marion Nelson. Go proclaim the gospel of peace and know the restored church of Jesus Christ. That the power to seal families on earth and in heaven has been restored. Go do it. Don't miss the opportunity. I bear witness that if you do so, your lives will be blessed in remarkable ways. In ways that are simply incalculable. I'm a Tongan boy. Came from Tonga when I was seven years old. First time I wore shoes was when we boarded the plane to come to America. And the blessings that have come to my life have all been related to and tied, connected to the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm so grateful for the missionaries that came to Tonga and taught the restored gospel to my great-grandparents and allowed five generations of my family to be members of the church of Jesus Christ. I bear witness that it is true, that the Book of Mormon is true. It was translated by the prophet Joseph Smith through the power of God. The Book of Mormon is true. Jesus Christ is the redeemer of mankind. He is Alpha and Omega, which means he was with us in the beginning and he will be with us in the end is my testimony in the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I just want to tell you, we love you. You are so magnificent. Thank you for being who you are. Thank you, Courtney and Luke. We love you too. Thank, Thank you so much. We love you guys.